Well, thank you so much for being with me, Aaron Prashant. I'm uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Binaj. It's a delight to join you and be following so many other fantastic guests you have had on your show. I have been looking forward to this conversation with eagerness. I read your book, uh, Prashant. Uh, it's a very insightful book. Um, I read a lot of books these days. And to be honest, um, there are very few books that I can call um, real informative book with no BS. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you about is that what is so bad about small data? Why does everyone want big data, big things, big cars, big burgers? I think the fundamental aspect, Minaj, is humans have always been data producing creatures and data consuming creatures. While there is a lot of focus on data analytics, AI, ML right now, if we go back into recorded history as far back as possible, we'll see that the earliest documents are actually facts, figures, and data. If you go back to Egypt, you will see that the records that we have today are, a lot of the records are how the pyramids were built, how bread was rationed, what wine was given out to the workers. If you go to the Indus Valley civilization, very close to where you are right now, you'll find that the earliest records are of trade and grain and harvest, same thing with China. In any recorded history, we find that we want to essentially consume data. We want to use that to predict what the future will look like. And it is not surprising that the earliest predictions in humankind have been almanacs talking about climates and harvests and so on and so forth. So the desire for us to be able to consume data and use that for better decision-making and use that to understand what the future portents is not new at all. It is as old as human existence. And the difference is today we have technology and we live in an age of datafication where things that could not be quantitatively measured in the past can be measured quantitatively and more importantly, can be shared. It's very interesting that you say that um, things can be quantitatively measured and shared. And a lot of people think of it um, as for granted that we are able to generate such huge amounts of data that um, people of medieval times would never possibly imagine. And when we talk about huge amount of data, we also have um, this question of how do we make sense of these data? And when we talk about big data, there are three things um, that are garnered um, during these conversations, three Vs of big data that you talk about in your book, the volume, uh, velocity, and variety. And um, your personal uh, secret sauce is our two additional Vs, which I find very interesting um, that no one else actually thought about the value and the veracity of the data itself. Um, can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I obviously have to give credit to one of your previous guests, uh, somebody who I enjoy reading a lot, uh, Doug Laney, who coined the first three Vs. And the thing is the next two Vs over the course of experience over the last couple of decades, what I have found is if there is no value that is coming out of the data and the value has multiple dimensions, it's not just a technology dimension, it's also a business dimension and a human dimension. And that just comes down to the realities of the fact that in the end, we live in a world where every dollar or every rupee has to have some return on investment, whether that is uh, profits or whether that is not for profit, it does greater good. And being able to drive value out of data is extremely important. Now I do differ slightly with um, other people who feel that data itself has intrinsic value. I personally believe and I write about that data has little intrinsic value unless it's put to work, right? Uh, we use the term uh, data as the new oil. Well, <clears throat> the fact is that uh, 
in the same way, I don't think you can pump crude oil into your cars or you can't basically take crude oil and make it into plastics or anything else. You have to refine that into the various things that come out of it. You have to distill that crude in order to get various things that can be used for other purposes. In a similar way to me, big data by itself without being able to convert that into a way by which it can generate value is going to result in a situation where people are starting to question the value of collecting, storing, and managing that data. And by the way, that is not cheap, right? Number one. Number two, veracity, as you point out, is extremely important. In the world we live in has a lot of data. We live now in a time where you have industrial IoT devices, you have home health monitors, you have smart meters, and so on and so forth, which are creating data every microsecond, literally speaking. And we have to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. You got to be able to isolate signal from noise. And in order to do that, I introduced the concept of veracity and I further define it as being different from old school data quality. Now you may wonder what is old school data quality? Old school data quality is this idea that somehow every piece of data has to be converted into perfect quality before it can be put to use. And I argue in the book that that is not possible because of multiple reasons. And I am not going to be able to go over every single reason, but a couple of reasons are, one is the definition of data itself changes over time. And it changes as a result of business reasons. It can change as a result of new processes and so on and so forth. So. By the time we finish cleaning all the data in order to use it, uh, that data is actually stale. And stale data is also poor quality data because you're not putting it to use for time sensitive, context sensitive users. So we introduced the concept of data fidelity, which is the quality of the data in the context of its use and in the context of its users. And it's a concept that has resonated very well because those of us who have done data quality and data governance and so on and so forth realize that being able to leverage that data in its specific use, and I give a lot of examples of where a data may be perfect quality for one use case, but that same so-called clean data is not appropriate for another use case. So that also proves that you can't have this one size fits all data quality. And I'm glad to see that the industry and others are coming around more to that point of view. Um, part of a lot of communities um, were at the edge of research um, in data architecture um, and recently has been talking about um, the concept of data mesh, um, which is a unique architecture for how you streamline data. Um, for a lot of reasons, I personally think um, it's still a buzzword um, but one of the things that relates this concept to uh, something fascinating I read in your book is your idea of data fidelity and how it relates with feature engineering. Um, another wonderful thing that you talked about is the amount of external data that is available to be used in conjunction with the hospital or inbound data. And not only that, you also talked about the importance of metadata. Um, how that can be put into oper operationalization uh, for generating insights. Um, and the granular level of analysis that you put to things um, is fascinating. For example, you talk about use cases in which scenario the data that we have would be useful and in other scenarios that same data would only add to model uh, expansion and more compute power and more, less, uh, more abuse of time. Um, then you'll also talk about access points, like uh, where is data going to be consumed? Is it laptops? Is it cell phones? Is it web apps? Um, is it going to be a desktop app? And then who's going to be using that data? Is it human? Um, is it machines? Um, are they going to be in automated pipelines? And uh, for a lot of time when I first read that, and I had to read your chapter a couple of times before I came up um, with some understanding of the concept, um, which was the first time I actually heard about that. Um, and that's something that I want to talk to you about. 
internet of healthcare things. And now you see how all these uh, things that you talk about and you made a base in your chapter um, goes to a larger concept of internet, internet of things. When we thought about that, we only thought about industrial uh, applications of um, line jobs and manufacturing. This is a unique concept. Expand a little bit on that. How did you come up with the idea? I mean, a lot of it had to do actually with prior experience, Pinach, because back in the mid 2000s, when I was working with one of my uh, uh, companies that I was consulting with, they were trying to essentially do, they were not, they were trying to, they were doing disease management and they were looking at the top five diseases. And what they were trying to do was trying to get a better idea of the life of the patient outside of the hospital, because ideally speaking, you want your patients to be spending more time at home and less time in the hospital, right? And then, but the thing is, how do you then track what happens between hospital visits? Because healthcare by its very nature is episodic. It's, it's a time series problem for the vast majority. And especially if you're someone who has, it's definitely true in wellness, but it's also true in case of people who have diseases because it doesn't happen as discrete events. It happens as continuous events and whether it is a disease that somebody is suffering from or whether it's a medication they're taking or if they are perfectly fine and they are just completely well. There is a lot of stuff that happens between hospital visits, between lab visits and so on and so forth. So when we started seeing some of the more, the internet of industrial things, my point was why, and, and to your point, Minaj, it, it, while the book came out in 2017, I did almost two years of research to write the book. So in 2015, what I proposed was there is quite a bit of stuff that is happening from multiple dimensions. One is being able to track what is going on in a privacy protected way of a person's and individual's life uh, at their home that can happen through implants, for example, pacemakers and so on and so forth, which are necessary to keep somebody alive, right? It can happen through uh, devices, for example, things such as sleep apnea machines and uh, IoT enabled asthma inhalers and so on and so forth. And more recently, it can also happen through wearables. So if you take a look at, for example, what some of the smartwatch folks are doing, we are, I, I wear a smartwatch now uh, that allows me to monitor my EKG. It's, I, I wouldn't, it, there's disclaimers around it, but I can monitor my EKG. There is rumor that the next smartwatch from one of the leading manufacturers is going to be able to measure your blood glucose as a continuous glucose monitor. So the point is, how do we take advantage of this? And how do we use the data from somebody's life, from somebody's behaviors to supplement and augment the data that comes out of clinical labs and hospital and clinic visits? And how do we create a more focus on health as opposed to care? I think it's very interesting um, that your book was very futuristic for 2017. Now that we have looked um, recently, I've shared um, the information that Facebook research has um, let out about its VR and AR capabilities. Um, and it's astounding um, the length at which um, we have gone to make the experience very personalized. On the other hand, we also have a lot of um, buzzwords and sometimes criminal cases. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with um, the CEO of Tyrannos, um, who's being investigated at the moment um, for um, medical technologies that do not exist. Um, and I'm just wondering, you are also um, in the process of um, publishing your book that's coming out um, this year sometime. And what can we expect uh, that uh, will be adding value to your already uh, quite um, predictive book uh, from 2017? I'm extremely glad to hear that feedback from you, Minaj, somebody who moves in multiple circles and who talks to some prominent 
very prominent thought leaders. I always like to think myself, and I take a lot of pride in saying I'm not a futurist. I'm a presentist, which is a lot of my focus is on what can we do now, right? As opposed to an Alvin Toffler, like what will happen 25, 50, 100 years from now? Because uh, first is I think it's pretty difficult to predict the future with certainty as we saw even with COVID-19. Um, I don't know how, we, we all knew in general that there would be a pandemic, but that's because of the history of pandemics. Every few years, we tend to go through a pandemic. Um, and it's really heartwarming to hear your comment there because I, I take a lot of pride and happiness in the fact that a lot of the things that I wrote about in terms of both what could be done then in 2017 and where things were going, were actually based on a very, what I would call a reality lens that I always put in front of myself, which is don't talk about, you know, the artificial intelligence machine that is going to do a surgery on you without your permission. That's completely bizarre. Speak instead about how data and analytics and AI can help create better experience for individuals, for patients, for clinicians, administrators, policymakers, and so on and so forth. So I'm glad to see that some of the things that I wrote about then have actually come true. In fact, many, many of them, as you can uh, see, have come true in four years. And that was the goal. It was to think of the near-term future rather than the distant future, which I'm not going to be alive to see whether it's true or not. And so in terms of the next book, Demystifying AI for the Enterprise, uh, Building Tomorrow's Self-Driving Organization, is along the same lines. It's looking at the concept of a word that we use often and that we see often, digital transformation. And a lot of organizations are looking at digital transformation. Some of them are doing it. Some of them are in the process of doing it. Others want to do it and are trying to figure out how. So what I examined in that book along with my co-authors, who's literally a who's who of the analytics and data and uh, AI space, is look at how enterprises can become not just data-driven enterprises, but more importantly, enterprises which have AI with the A representing augmented and amplified intelligence supporting decision making and how to make that real. Because while there are multiple aspects to digital transformation, the single most important driver is going to be AI. Not that other things don't matter, but AI is going to have a disproportionate impact on what happens with digital transformation. How do you then help organizations make it real? What do you do from a talent perspective? How do you set up your teams? What do you deal with culture? How do you deal with culture? How do you set up your processes? And so on and so forth. So it's not so much a book for uh, data scientists or data geeks like you and I. It's more a book as like my previous books for executives and managers and people who are not technical to understand what big data and little data and AI means. And more importantly, prescriptive methods on how to put it in action so that you can develop both competitive advantage and make life better for your employees and your customers. Um, I think it fits right into um, the kind of work or the futuristic um, analysis of how market is going to um, shape when H2 brought on one of the best people um, in the machine learning, machine learning and community, Kaggle Grindmasters. If you look at their um, talks when they talk to each other, it's very addictive for someone like me who's uh, I get crazy about new technology and how that can actually impact um, human understanding of um, science and um, future. And then um, H2O now, um, with the help of brilliant people like you, um, are trying to make a difference between um, what we know and what we don't know. 
And uh, uh, the question here is, you have known to make difference um, in a lot of organizations throughout your career. Um, talk about Siemens, talk about um, Deloitte, talk about UNO, um, Oracle. Uh, I've read uh, some of um, your work when you were um, at Oracle, and it was always so fascinating. And I'm just wondering, working in those companies, does it? Do you think that they have paved your way in becoming an, an, an analytical and keen leader that you are? And is does it actually help you in the role that you're currently at at H2O? Yes, and I've can just a obvious disclaimer. These are my uh, personal opinions and thoughts, especially the crazy ones. Uh, so uh, I'm not representing either H2O or any of the previous employers. I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Um, but having said that, I think our competence, our skills, our thoughts, and our behaviors are a sum total of many things that happen. One of those is definitely the organizations I've worked for and the opportunities that I have gotten. I am deeply grateful for the organizations that I've worked at for giving me the opportunities. And I'm also grateful for the colleagues that I have worked with who have taught me a lot of things, not just from a business side or a product side or a technology side, but also in other ways. And I like to think of myself, uh, Minaj, as a sponge, a sponge that soaks in things and then tries to use that to improve and better myself, not to get uh, too esoteric or philosophical or religious over here, but I do have a very Sufi-like mindset in terms of being able to explore within ourselves, within myself and to accept the fact that it is really a continuous improvement project with myself to see how I can do it. But having said that, as you and I have discussed in the past and you have heard in some of my other interviews, I also give a lot of credit to my parents and my mother, for example, who, who taught me a love for reading, um, taught me a love for going and thinking about things critically and then going and speaking about it. Uh, my father who gave me kind of the engineering mindset. So I think it's all of that, frankly speaking. It is the work that you do, the organizations and the people you have worked with. It's the upbringing uh, that my parents generously gave me and, and also the things that the mistakes have made. Yeah, beautiful um, quote that mistakes. Um, when people talk to me about uh, their successes, I sometimes ask them, uh, well, tell me a little bit about your failures also, because uh, a man is um, known by his mistakes and not his um, successes uh, in many situations. Uh, and I'm glad you brought the disclaimer in here that you um, will be opining uh, on a personal capacity, which gives me permission to take you on off professional um, questions, which is that you are a very well-traveled man. Um, you have lived in uh, Sweden, in Germany, um, in Australia. Um, you love to interact with people. You make friends very easily. Um, what is so, I'm curious, what is so inspiring about Mongolia? I didn't expect that one, uh, but obviously you have done your research. Uh, for one, I think uh, it's just, you know, I think we all want to go to places where there are beautiful beaches, beautiful mountains, and they rank higher on uh, four doors travel or one of those things. And then there are these esoteric pieces, places where you just want to go. And I, many years ago, I read a book, this is almost 25 years ago. It was a book called Genghis Khan by Vasily Yan. Now, Genghis Khan is not exactly a person who's known in history for all of the things I believe in, which is kindness, empathy, and so on and so forth, right? So I 
want to put that disclaimer also. When I mentioned the book, it's of no admiration for the evil that Genghis Khan did. But if you actually look at Genghis Khan's life, there were a few things about him that caused him to become what he became. He ruled over a part of the world that is far larger, almost from the banks of the Danube all over to China. And he did that. He's, what many people don't know is he was actually a slave. And he, uh, he lived many years as a slave. And then it was actually, he was a late blossomer, so to speak. It was almost at the age of 40 where he started becoming the world conqueror that he became. And he died, roughly speaking, around the age of 65. He did more in 25 years than any ruler has done in terms of being able to do certain things. Again, disclaimer, not the killing and the genocide, but even the fact that he was able to rule over such a large part of the known world at the time. And the reason I think is basically his, his ability to read and understand people. A lot of the chronicles that you read, whether it is by Rashid Eldin, who wrote a lot of the, uh, the first authentic biography of Genghis Khan, talks about his ability to meet people at one time and understand them. And there is a lot of understanding of how the environment shaped him to be what he became. So I by no means have uh, understand what is it that, that about that environment? And But the thing is, just because of that interest in history, uh, Mongolia is a place where I just want to go see what was it about this place? It was actually a sparse populated land, steppes, deserts, and mountains. What is it that molds character? What is it that caused somebody like him to develop what he did? Now, you can ask the question, is it nature or nurture? And I think most of us will agree that it's not either or, it's a combination of both. And so it's just a, it's just an absolute fascinating thing. At some point, I just want to visit and kind of retrace the route that, uh, that the Mongols did. You know, we all have our quirks, I guess that's one of mine. Um, no, now really stepping on my territory, I love talking about, um, <laughs> Uh, psychology and philosophy and um, Sufism. And we're going to get back to that, I promise. But, you know, one of the quotes before I move on um, that I've heard from one of the expats who have lived in Mongolia uh, many years ago. And he told me that um, it, it's a common proverb there that, you know, when people um, sleep under a roof, their dreams are as high as the roof. But when you sleep under the stars, your dreams are as high as the stars, which I find fascinating. It's a wonderful way of putting things um, and taking those stars uh, into numbers again. Um, Forbes recently uh, published an article talking about um, how big data is a loaded term now and it's dead. Now we should talk about smart data. And in his defense, the author argued that 90% of AI and machine learning products and projects fail because um, there are so many complexities um, involved in the process, both on the data analytics part, um, ML ops part, um, data explanation part, um, and the cost involved. And uh, you wrote in your book chapter um, that Eric Schmidt um, already in 2010 um, talked about that the data um, that has been created since human civilization the year 2023. Um, now we are creating that same amount of data every two days. I think about the magnitude at which we are producing data. Um, you also talked about um, 6,000 miles um, of bookshelves in jail library, um, if we were to actually put them in one straight line. And which brings us to a question that if you already have that data, uh, isn't the author right in saying that big data is probably overwhelming and a buzzword, and now we should be focusing on how to use the data smartly? 
Well, this is a, a, a multifaceted question and to do justice to it, I'm going to ramble on a little more than even usual, Minaj. So I think first thing is what big data was and how it was uh, defined, right? And I think big data was defined in terms of the technology that was being used. And I think that was the fundamental place where the, the error started, if I may. Because if we go back to what happened with big data, big data was not defined as Doug Laney did very well in terms of the three Vs or my additional two Vs. It was defined as something that you could put into a big data store, Hadoop or whatever it is. And I think that was a fundamental problem because I remember when this whole conversation of big data was going on, uh, a, whole, a whole lot of uh, that time, the conversation was about how easy it is to put data into technology X. And then not just I, but at that time I was at Oracle and uh, Larry Ellison had made a comment, which I thought still resonates today, which is it's okay to put data. How are you going to query that data out? How are you going to convert that data into insights, right? And I think that was the fundamental challenge. Uh, I think we got a bit ahead of ourselves in assuming that technology X represents big data. And it's actually something that I've been wanting to write an article on Minaj, because I think it's a bit unfair that we have taken the idea that is defined by the three characteristics of the data, the three Vs, Doug's three Vs, and the two characteristics of usage, which is veracity and value, which are my two Vs. And instead we put a technology lens on it that gets rid of the essential characteristics of the data, right? So I think the problem started right from there. And as a result of some of the challenges we have seen with these specific technologies, today big data has become in many ways a dirtier word. But in the end, the idea of big data is not just the five E's, but also more importantly, data that represents behavior, that represents events, that represents the known knowns and the unknown unknowns that we then put to use via AI ML, advanced analytics, and other types of analytics in order to get value out of it. So I think that's the first, first thing there. I do agree with the author who says that in order for us to put this data to work, one has to basically look at how we uh, create. Um, I, I, first thing is I think you need to apply data fidelity, right? First and foremost. And then how do you convert that into features? How do you convert that into models? But that is only part of the issue. The bigger question is how do you then take the results of that and how do you put those insights into practice? How do you connect it to workflow systems? How do you make it where it is just in time and context sensitive? In other words, the prediction should come up when I'm in a part of a workflow or from a business process perspective, I need to do something and it should be relevant and contextual to that action or that point in time or that specific behavior. And I think that is really where you start creating the ability for people to use data in all its forms, big, small, everything in between, to create value for business, value for users. And so it's not just in my opinion, which is where I slightly, uh, I would I hesitate to say I differ because I don't, but at the same time, I think it's not about big data or smart data. It is about context sensitive, value driven insights, actions, and workflows. And the argument between purely what is the definition of big data and what is smart data is kind of like uh, uh, arguing about something that has an interesting philosophical bent, but frankly speaking, <clears throat> is not the real question, which is why in the next book, we speak a lot about putting that into usage, putting it into practice. And also most importantly, Vinaj, as you know, creating continuous feedback loops that allow people to provide feedback on the data. 
You know, I find myself in um, such a fortunate position to be able to talk to um, leaders and visionary leaders like you and Doug. Um, and SIDA works with a lot of uh, um, companies and universities uh, pushing forward um, the um, scientific knowledge um, and most importantly to apply that um, to create um, returns. And the thing that you talk about um, is really hard. I mean, you yourself have uh, have a lifetime of experience um, talking to engineers um, and C-suite employees, um, as well as line managers. Uh, and I have found in my experience that it is a huge issue um, at some point. Um, engineering team says that it's always not like you, there's people with um, nice suits and shoes and ties and shirts um, who don't understand uh, machine learning processes, how big data is um, handled. And C-suite employees are always after engineering team. Well, you're talking about wonderful uh, engineering feats and products, but you don't understand that if it's not generating a return on an investment, um, it's a futile attempt. And I guess numbers are in their favor when we talk about the failure rate, which is quite um, high in that industry. And I was just wondering, um, there are fantastic articles on creating a data culture um, in your organization. And um, I believe full stack training has um, a complete guide to creating data teams and uh, nurturing those teams and creating a culture um, that puts focus on bringing all these teams together to understand the bigger picture. And you have worked in one of the best places in the world. We're working in um, data sector, data governance, um, data um, privacy and um, everything related to the data. How do you bridge that gap? I'll, I'll give you a very obvious answer first and then I'll give you a less obvious answer later. The most obvious answer is wait for the next copy of my book and buy it. It's coming out from Taylor and Francis. It's called Demystifying AI for the Enterprise. But of course, I'm kidding, right? Because I think the last book did pretty well. This one will do well, not just because of me, but also with the brilliant minds with whom I'm co-authoring it. But that, <clears throat> that was actually facetious. So let me get to a serious answer on this. How do you bridge the gap? So there are certain things that people are talking about today, because I think you hit upon the problem space very, very nicely, is you have technology people, you have business people. And what I have found from my own experience is in the end, <clears throat> we live in an area of hyper-specialization in general. And hyper-specialization has been something that's been happening since almost the industrial revolution because it has been easier for us to have specialized roles to do certain things, right? Uh, you could say in many ways, the era of hyper-specialization started off actually with assembly line as a part of the post-industrial revolution part of uh, manufacturing. And things have become more and more specialized. Now, what has happened in the last 40 years, I would say, Minaj, is hyper-specialization has become all the more necessary because in the end, the technology, especially in the world that you and I live in, has evolved and has become so important and so needed that the field of study and the field of inquiry, the field of practice actually benefits from hyper-specialization. Now, having said that, I think one of the uh, uh, key things to keep in mind is a concept that various people are talking about of late, uh, I've been playing that role for the last 20 years, so it doesn't seem that outlandish or foreign to me, is the concept of some people call it a data translator, some people call it an analytics translator. There are others who call it an AI product manager. The various terms that are being used. But to me, the key thing for organizations to be able to leverage the data, leverage the analytics, leverage the AI ML, and put it to business use is not going to be to convert our business operations and process people into data scientists and data engineers. It's not going to be to convert data engineers and data scientists into the other thing. Because if we do that, we lose out on the advantage of hyper specialization. What we instead need to focus on is create the new role of the translator, right? It, you don't have to call it that, it could be something else. 
but it's really that new role and that role has a few characteristics one it is somebody who understands the business well enough or can learn the business well enough they understand the domain two like me they may not be a data scientist but at the same time they understand how and what value data science can bring to the table and more importantly are able to connect a business problem that you hear in business terms domain terms and plain english to the technology aspects and basically it's a process of then inquiry that goes into creating use cases creating solutions driving roi driving value i would also argue to a certain extent pinaj that it takes us to a less hyper specialized way uh rob hillard uh, one of my former colleagues at deloitte talks about the model t where he says that you know the vertical of the t is specialized knowledge and the horizontal of the t is generalized knowledge and to be really successful you need to be able to straddle the t where you go in specialized and you create value through specialization but you basically look at generalization on applications i have found that to be an excellent metaphor that i think does a better job of describing um how those things need to come together um i think you you rightly said the fact that you know if you have a strong foundation of your um subject and your data science is kind of a wrapper then um that expands the field and bringing automation and technology into your existing field so this is why we have seen a uh, recent mushrooming of a lot of uh, people from diverse backgrounds and disciplines come together and uh, work on unique problems uh, for example i was talking to luis serrano who's by training a mathematician or physician a wonderful co- um, quantum um, scientist at zapata uh, which is a company who's working at the forefront of quantum computing um one of the thing that um i wanted to talk to you about is that i recently um talked with uh mark um who had the medicine extreme medicine um foundation and his work with nasa such a wonderful guy to talk to about he's been traveling around um and he talks about and my personal experience is also like doctors take a lot of time to graduate and start making money uh meanwhile you're just simply raking a uh, student debt or if you are lucky enough to be studying in a, a european country where government pays for that it's still a long and lonely um career but at the end of the tunnel when you start um with your job or your um house job or um you're getting to a serious level where you're doing your residencies the fear that is becoming more obvious in these hyper specialized people is that ai and big data is going to convert them into a 10 dollar uh, physician uh, in a 10 dollar clerk and you have talked about that uh, in your um this talk with uh, um i don't i don't remember which was that um but it, i think it's in the book also in demystifying okay. big data and machine learning for healthcare yeah. and that's I, a huge I, that's a huge fear among you know a lot of professionals um and i was just think, thinking um how do you relate to the uh, fact that when electricity came um uh, coal workers didn't you know lose their livelihood they were still alive you know the, the nature of the jobs changed um how do you see that uh, play out in medical industry i i i think minaj we have been served very poorly a bit of a controversial statement but i'm going to make it by the so called singularists the people who have been announcing singularity for the last 25 30 years i won't name them uh but there are quite a few people who have made a career of predicting when ai will take over the world and um i think it was initially the year 2000 uh kind of coincided with y2k then it became 2005 2010 2015 20 25 and right now it's 2043 apparently but then one of those prominent people just said no maybe it's not 2043 maybe it's 2065 so i think the first lesson i took out of it was don't believe people whose predictions are wrong because they have a horrible track record at doing it so the next time somebody comes and tells me that singularity is happening in 
some other year. The only thing that is predictable about singularity, Minaj, is the fact that every two years, the day when singularity will happen seems to change. That is about the only reliable prediction around singularity, frankly. So <laughs> it's not a grain of salt. It's a barrel of salt that you have to consume every time you hear somebody pronounce singularity. Second, it fundamentally misunderstands how people use technology. Technology has not, yes, in today's age, we like to believe that we are you know, technologically advanced. Yes, we are. But technology advancement is relative. It is not absolute. For the uh, earliest humans, fire was a technological advancement. It was a natural phenomenon, but then being able to harness the fire to be able to create value out of it, to be able to use it for smelting, for example, to create metal tools, was a huge technological leap going beyond stone tools. In a similar way, agriculture was a technological advancement. And when we talk about mutations and we talk about genetic mutations and bioengineering and genetic engineering and so on and so forth, humans have been doing that. They just didn't call it that. They didn't understand the mechanisms all the time of what led to it. But we have been harnessing crops, uh, the part of the world that you and I originally hail from, uh, accounts for a large part, significant part of the world's diverse biodiversity. And we have been looking at crops, whether it's grains or fruits or even animals for that matter. And we have been doing selection of things to benefit humans. The same thing with the printing press, the same thing with the steam engine. So there is this fear sometimes, and I think there are people who contribute to it, uh, which is either on one hand, as you, you read in the book, on one hand, that AI is going to take over the world, right? If we are all going to be living in this Terminator-like, Skynet-like world or the iRobot kind of world where humans don't matter anymore. AI is going to be the overlord. It's absolute. For those of us who actually work in the space and who look at history and are students of history, I think that's very important. Technology advancements are not going to replace humans. Tech, and, and, and as you know, Minaj, I make a point of this in demystifying big data and machine learning very strongly, that like other technologies that we have gone through as individuals and as a society and cultures, this technology is going to make life easier for humans. It's going to make life better for humans. It's going to, machine intelligence is not a replacement for human intelligence. Machine intelligence augments and amplifies human intelligence, which again, I write about in more detail in the next one. Now, we, I also think that we do ourselves a disservice when we talk about automation as being the end goal of AI. Is AI going to lead to automation? Of course, it's going to lead to automation. But so did the printing press. It meant that people didn't have to sit and scribe things on rock or stone or papyrus or animal hides. The printing press led to a dissemination of knowledge on a scale that couldn't have been possible if people had been doing it. So that was the automation of the 15th century, right? So automation is, and automation will continue to happen. But to somehow assume that that happens at the expense of the human is basically ignoring trends that have happened for millennia and somehow assuming that this is the thing that is going to break the camel's back. What I predict, um, based on, again, looking at patterns, which is part of what we do, is AI is going to remove the robot out of the human. It's going to remove the repetitive mundane tasks that frankly speaking are better done by a machine. And it's going to lead to a place where not just from a commercial and business point of view, but also from a personal and a society point of view, we do more and better things. Now, what does that really mean? Let me go back to the example of 
the people who say that AI is going to replace physicians. Um, people who say that understand neither AI nor medicine. And I know I'm saying some strong statements here because that's true, right? If you kind of take a look at the United States where I live, um, the amount of time that physicians spend on administrative tasks, filling out paperwork to submit a claim and the number of people that they have to hire, is just, frankly, it takes away from both the quality of care and the cost of care because they are spending more time. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from physicians, both in physician offices and clinics and hospitals, and how much time they spend in filling out paperwork. So the point is, can you use uh, data and AI to be able to make their lives easier so that they spend, they are, a physician doesn't go to medical school to pile up the kind of debts and to go to school and residency for 10 years to fill out a piece of paper. They do it because they care about patients. They care about the Hippocratic Oath. They care about keeping people well and safe. And the purpose of AI in medicine has to be to take medicine back to what physicians want it to be, which is about caring for their patients, being able to spend more time with them, leveraging and generating empathy, being able to provide patients with the tools that will manage their care better in between hospital visits or clinic visits at home, being able to give policymakers the insights, not just the data, so that they can take investment decisions in terms of public health and so on and so forth. So uh, I completely don't subscribe to this. In 2017, when I wrote this, it was even more of a loaded statement today because that was, or 2015, when I started writing the book, because at that time, it was all about singularity. The robots are going to take over the world. And frankly speaking, Minaj and Prashant are not going to be talking to each other in 2021. It'll be two avatars of them that will use AI to replicate their minds. And we know now that that's not true. So sorry, uh, but I do, I do tend to have a very strong opinion on that. And again, will I be wrong? I may be wrong. Uh, but if you look at history and if you look at patterns, uh, I'm guessing that my prediction is going to be more right than people who have been consistently wrong about singularity over the last 25 years. Well, so far you have been quite spot on with your predictions, but let's um, talk about a uh, third species, um, not human, and uh, not robot. And uh, frankly, you have had a very inspiring career, but some of your life choices are less understandable than the others. Uh, for example, um, as someone who is a passionate fan, a lifelong uh, a crazy child who have uh, watched Lion King. It pains me a lot when you name your dog Simba. I mean, what kind of person names dog Simba? Uh, it's supposed to be for lion. I do understand the fact that, you know, you cannot have a lion at home, but seriously, I mean, whose idea was that? Um, it, it was the idea of the uh, uh, dog shelter where we adopted Simba from. So Simba was a severely abused dog that was basically uh, had a tough time earlier in its life as a pup and so on and so forth without going into all of the sorry detail. And uh, when we, my daughter at that time was two years old and we were living in California and Livermore surrounded by houses that had dogs. And so she wanted a dog. And I did what all uh, uh, fathers do. I told my wife, I'll take responsibilities for the dog, which I haven't. And when we went to adopt the dog, we saw this really frightened puppy. And we felt that rather than take a dog that was, um, you know, in very good health, both physical and mental, we had actually adopted a dog that needed that human love. And so we adopted Simba. And when we adopted Simba, one of the things we decided was we we're going to keep the name as Simba simply because of the fact that, I mean, that was the one thing that he used to respond to when he was absolutely terrified of humans in general. 
So we decided to keep that name as it is. Yes, a bit of cognitive dissonance there, but it was an important step in his rehabilitation. It took us almost, I would say, three years, Minaj, before he started trusting humans and before he would actually go out on the road without shrinking in fear. And it was a long process, but that was one of the things we decided to do, at least keep that thing that he was familiar with while trying to work on the other things. I think it's fascinating the importance of kindness and love and sympathy um, that we frankly can learn from animals that um, we're lacking these days in, in society, especially the modern society where people tend to rely on governmental support and welfare and care more than the traditional values of neighborhood, um, which is a very good segue into talking another aspect of medical um, and, and healthcare communities that no one does, frankly, and I don't know why. Um, it's because of our Indian roots or it's something that we generally um, pay a lot of importance, which is the importance of the <laughs> mental health and psychological well-being um, in societies. Um, I've talked to some very influential researchers and thinkers around the world um, on this topic, my personal research areas in personality psychology also. And a lot of them agree that um, not always your disorders and diseases have a genetic or a phenotypical origin. Um, we live in a society where burnout is a huge problem. Workplace stress is a huge problem. Depression has become the leading cause of workplace disability in 2021. And the importance of relaxing, plugging out, uh, finding things that you enjoy in your personal life, um, motivation to do things, um, doing things out of passion is somehow missing uh, from the mainstream life. And you talked about your um, deep admiration and love um, of Sufism and uh, a lifestyle that is oriented in peace. Um, tell me uh, from your personal experience when you interact with people, when you talk to a lot of patients and healthcare professionals, how important is kindness um, in the healthcare sphere? Um, I would like to make that answer a bit broader if you don't mind. And I would say healthcare or not, it, essentially. And I by no means say that I'm perfect. I'm still a work in progress in my mid 40s. So there are things I can do better. So this is by no means preachy or holier than thou answer at all. Uh, I continue to make mistakes. I can be more kinder. I can be more empathetic and I continue to learn. And when I make mistakes, I try to catch myself. I try to apologize when when I have not been as kind and empathetic as I should be. And I try to use that experience to be better the next time when faced with a similar situation or a similar event. So I talk to you, Minaj, on this particular question as a very flawed person, but somebody who tries to improve. I think uh, fundamentally, I have again a slightly different point of view. And I think there's a pattern and trend which you have seen before with me, which is I do tend to be a bit of a contrarian in terms of not being able to always go with the prevailing opinion, as you saw in the books, as you saw in my public interviews and talks. Not because I want to be contrarian, because that's basically what I, it's what I have as a result of critical thinking, as a result of experiences, as I've come to that point of view. And the day that that point of view is proven to be wrong uh, with data, I'll change that point of view, uh, right? But I think if you look at us as a society, as, as humankind over the last, and let's not go back to the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Indians, Indus Valley and Chinese as we did previously when we talked about Let's just talk about the last 200 years. I think despite the fact that there is, uh, there are things that shouldn't be happening at a societal level, in general, we live in a time where people are actually, and this is where I'm a bit contrarian. I think in general, people are more kind to each other than they were 100 years ago, certainly more 
than they were 200 years ago. I think we live in a time of absolutely unprecedented prosperity and opportunity. Yes, it is not equal, some areas more than others, but I think in general, uh, we live in an area of more kindness than ever before in our history, more opportunity than ever before in history, more prosperity than ever before in history. The average life expectancy in the part of the world, uh, South Asia, for example, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, was about in the mid thirties, about 70, 80 years ago, right? And our life expectancy has almost doubled. And that is not just true of South Asia, our life expectancy has doubled overall. And being the absolute optimist that I am, um, and also being supported with the data, I think that we will actually are on a trend to become kinder, more understanding, more prosperous. And that we that has been the trajectory so far. And I strongly, strongly believe that that's going to continue to be the case. Will there always be anomalies and exceptions to the rule? Yes. But that is how, Vinaj, going back to your question, is we use shared experiences. We try to understand each other. And we essentially move towards this essential concept, whether it is a Sufi concept or it is a concept in expressed in Hinduism as Vasudeva Kutumbam, which is basically the whole world is one. And how do we become better individuals? How do we become better cultures? How do we become better societies? And how do we not just recognize our shared human experience, but we also do it with other living beings. Um, I think I, I actually feel wildly optimistic about where we are going as a society. I think you're 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 very right, and I also appreciate the fact that you know I get to talk to people who um, have the temerity to disagree and be contrarian, because otherwise it won't be a fruitful conversation. You know, if you're talking about the same things. Um, my point, however, was um, not the collective life and uh, the material successes. For example, um, you can live to be a hundred, but how you live um, is a total different ballpark. Um, have you have a, had a happy life? Uh, was uh, this a productive life? Was it a enriching life? Uh, but I can I can see you know this conversation can uh, totally boil over to a lot of other places. But I want to connect it with a very important question: that if we are able to double the lifespan of human beings in a matter of a century, or let's say less than that. And we have made huge strides in technology, AI, data science, and computer science. Why does it remain the fact that we don't still have a global universal healthcare? And we'll talk about US, um, one of the best innovations, great minds, um, funding, work culture, everything is there. And yet, if you talk about healthcare, um, Andorra, Costa Rica, and um, a lot of other countries, you don't much talk talk about much. They are above U.S. U.S. ranks 37 among all countries, and remains the only country that uh, does not provide universal healthcare um, in Western world. And I was just wondering. To quote um, the Spider Man, you know, with power comes the responsibility also. Isn't it what we expect from people who have the power and the intellect and the ability to do something for people, to treat people who cannot take care of themselves? Um, there have been, of course, activities and um, discussions around how to make the best of situations. Um, we had talked about Medicare. Um, Obama had also had a plan for that. Um, what do you think about the situation? Do you see as a person that um, healthcare should be something that should be available to everyone? So, now some of your audience may think, well, 
Prashant had an answer for everything. Is he going to do a cop out right now? Um, but I would go back. There are certain questions, Minaj, where I would go back to uh, Burton Russell, who said that you know the whole problem is that the world is filled with fools and fanatics who are always certain of themselves, but wiser people are full of doubts. And it's not a cop out, but this is one thing where. I am still trying to figure that out. I have been in this space for the last almost, I would say, 20 plus years in various aspects, working not just with physicians and nurses, uh, but also patients and also policymakers. And I am still, I, I, I think there's a few things I think there is a need for universal primary care because the vast majority of issues that we face as a society can be dealt with and addressed from a primary care perspective before they become more serious, frankly. So I think we certainly at the minimum must have universal primary care. Uh, a person shouldn't have to take a decision about whether they can go see someone for primary care. So I think there are certain things that need to be more, shall we say, equal in terms of access, more uh, affordable and more democratic. Primary care is one of them. Uh, pediatric care is another. And the third is maternal care. So between primary care, maternal care, and pediatric care, I think we can address a lot of the challenges we see today. Our outcomes, for example, on maternal health in the United States are actually pretty abysmal and shouldn't be the case for a country uh, filled with so many wise people and with so much brilliance on so many fronts. Now, I am... Again, I'm probably going to irritate both sides of the fence with this answer, but hey, you know. Uh, I think on the other hand, the United States to a large extent, not the only place, but to a large extent is still the fount of innovation that comes out of capitalism. So how do you, how do you draw that balance between access, affordability, health outcomes, and innovation. Because we do want innovation to continue. And there is a lot of a capitalist imperative to in innovation, which is why, frankly speaking, uh, you know, the ability for people to make profits, to me, is not, it's the, it, it's, Profit is not a four-letter word, right? But at the same time, I do agree 100% that primary maternal and pediatric care should be universal. Yeah, I guess you have a very fair point there. You know, in order to come up with those innovations, you need someone to invest in that. You know, you need people to um, profit, be able to profit from um, their hard work. And then you also need primary care also. Um, so I guess there, it's a very fine line where you walk when we talk about um, these discussions. Um, but one of the things that relates with this point is um, taking care of diseases and disorders before they happen. And I'm talking about preventative medicine that you have talked at length about um, in your book. And some of the ways of doing that is a genome profiling uh, for hereditary diseases. And then we have to the importance of databases for genotype and phenotype um, information of the patients. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, if only we could master preventative medicine in, um, in its completeness, there's, there's so much that we could save, not only in the healthcare budget, but also in terms of uh, agony, pain, and anguish. Uh, and what does research tell us about uh, the benefits of uh, precision uh, and preventative medicine, and how is that going to play out in healthcare? 
Milaj, I've never asked you how old you are, but maybe I should have asked you that at some time. But I can tell you that I'm old enough when I saw the last few cases of polio hmm. in India when I was studying. I had a couple of classmates who actually lost their legs to polio. Actually, Pakistan and, is the last country um, who had polio. And I think there was a case right. that came up uh, like a couple of years ago, which was very alarming because, you know, that was spread out. So, yeah, you, I think you are way old and, you know, I can guess. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at, you look at polio, what a fantastic success story, right? It, it started in the West, the polio vaccination, and then we made a concerted effort, governments across the world, to basically make polio history. Uh, same story with smallpox. For people who are not from South Asia, who don't know, I remember seeing people who had smallpox years ago and what it did to the body. Today, we don't talk about smallpox anymore because we have done a fantastic job as governments, as societies, as people to make smallpox history for the most part, right? Take a look at those two examples. It is an astounding testament to what we can do when we come together, frankly. So uh, the diseases that we now need to focus on not just in the West, but even more so in the East, are now lifestyle diseases. It's not smallpox and polio anymore. Because to a certain extent, uh, uh, I think we have done a fantastic job in taking some of these dreaded diseases. And I guess it's a blessing in disguise in some ways, uh, Minaj, that people from our neck of the woods are now more at danger of dying from lifestyle diseases than smallpox and polio. I, 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 I'm not, again, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying that it's a testament to the progress we have made as a result of medicine and medications and drugs. And it took governments, it took pharma, and research organizations, it took providers and hospitals and physicians and nurses, and more importantly, it took individuals who were open to education and who were willing to have their minds changed. And frankly, when we take a look at what is happening with COVID-19 and the COVID vaccine right now, where there is still quite a bit of uh, vaccine hesitancy and so on and so forth, to me, it's not an insurmountable problem. Um, I, I think the experience that we have had as societies with some of these real killer diseases tells us that we can absolutely get to a, a better place. But to your question, I think it also speaks to the fact, going back to my earlier comment about optimism and the upward trajectory in terms of where we live longer, we die of fewer diseases and the diseases that we have today are more treatable than ever before in our history. The next evolution is uh, wellness and preventive medicine and which also reminds me that I did not do my uh, elliptical session this morning. Well, um, you might not want to skip on that, uh, but going on ahead, um... I think that one of the game changing trends, um, which personally I'm looking out for is, and it used to be the tech company model. Um, Uber is the la largest um, driving network without owning any cars. Airbnb was the largest hotel chain without owning any, um, holding any uh, physical assets. The idea in healthcare, when it's applied, we talk about an architecture, where there's no need for hospitals. So it's an interconnected mesh uh, with customer and patient um, data. Um, you could have touch points uh, where you could go. Um, information sharing is um, private, secure, encrypted, accessible, and life-saving. Um, we have the power of monitoring devices that you have mentioned in your book. 
um, smartwatches, Fitbits, AR, VR gadgets. Then we have uh, biochips, Bluetooth um, inhalers for asthmatic people. Um, we have different scales, uh, prop, um, the oximeters, uh, blood pressure monitors, EEG, EKG, a lot of things um, that are out there uh, generating immensely valuable uh, biomedical um, data that physicians could use. How soon is that going to be um, s something that we would be able to um, enjoy? So I think uh, it's already here. It is absolutely already here. Because if we take, and I think it has been here for the last 40, 50 years, it's just that the scale keeps increasing. The day we implanted a pacemaker as a device that would basically regulate electrical pulses to keep your heart functioning, that day, I think we already started having the hospital at home. I think, um, sorry for interrupting you, but I think um, I do a lot of work with electrophysiological um, research. And I recently had uh, a neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Boris Baker, on the show. And we talked a lot about uh, limitations of these technologies also. Intervention in biological processes um, through artificial means um, can backfire. And we have cases, you know, in which um, the consequences are quite high. Uh, we also talked about Elon Musk's Neuralink um, and the implants uh, in animals for now, and then later uh, in people who have epilepsy and strokes. And uh, it, these Pandora boxes are quite um, secured at the moment. Um, I do understand, you know, this is something that we should explore, but then how soon do you think um, that would be incorporated in the corpus that we have at the moment of medical technologies? And then is it going to be private? Is it going to be safe? And is it going to be beneficial? So, so I think the answer is not binary, right, Minaj? It's not either or. Now, with any technology, there is always going to be uh, a danger associated with it. That itself, and I'm not saying that you or your other guests said that, but uh, I would say if you're driving a car, you're more likely to die in a car-to-car -car collision than a horse carriage-to-horse -horse carriage collision. By definition, does it mean that we will go back to horse carriages? Of course not, right? There is a chance that your airplane will lose all its four engines and fall out of the sky. Those things are always there. And it is our goal to make devices, care, and all that safer and better, right? And anytime you use technology, there is always a small part of risk and unknowns that we will have to address, which is again going back to our conversation, which is where the data comes in because you use the data and you use the insights and you use clinical trials and real world evidence to make things better and safer. But I think we are, the hospital of the future is not going to be a building that we have to go check into. It is going to be a combination going back to our earlier conversation of a hospital as a standalone, but also more importantly, a connected entity with the home. And the individual, if I may add. Of course. I think there's always, um, you rightly pointed out, um, there, there's a risk for innovation and you should, you should embrace it um, if you were to make any progress at all. Because if you've always done what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. In, in a safe way, in a safe way, right? So I, I think in the end, we have to be very careful about both not just the expected outcomes of new interventions, but also the expected risks. And we, we, cannot, we cannot allow technology for technology's sake. In the end, unfortunately, our history, and we have gotten much better at it, much, much better at it, is filled with times where we experimented with people without telling them, without getting informed consent, by invading their privacy. And a lot of this happened across the world in the 50s and the 60s, right up to the 70s in some cases, not too long ago. And so we have to be able to draw the line between the, I, I would say that it's, it's not just the Hippocratic Oath for clinicians. It's also the Hippocratic Oath for people like you and I, 
who are involved in the space. So we need to have the Hippocratic Oath in our own minds while we work in the space. And you know, that's a very interesting point, Minaj, that you bring up, because this is something probably worth considering. The Hippocratic Oath for Technologies in Health and Medicine. I think that should, they should add that at some point. I was talking to someone, I just don't remember their name, um, on the show about the importance of putting some kind of ethics course at undergraduate or graduate, because most of the time you're telling them about science, research methods, um, about different tools, how you use that. At some point, there has to be a course to tell them. And, you know, medicine does not have to be um, the alma mater for um, Hippocratic oath, you know, everyone else has the responsibility to be productive Absolutely. in the word uh, themselves also. But uh, let's talk about something interesting. Most people in um, of your stature, um, of your experience and um, your position, they tend to be futurist. You are a self-proclaimed presentist, <laughs> but your habits um, says, uh, tell us otherwise. You are a huge collector of vintage casino dices from Biagon, um, LA casinos. Like how many time epochs are you going to cover here? Oh, it, it again, uh, uh, you know, as John Santayana said very famously, uh, those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it again. So I would say that, uh, um, you know, others have called me a polymath. I don't like to call myself a polymath, I'm just a curious, absolutely curious individual, Minaj, who understands that there's a lot more I don't know than what I know. And so I think casino dice are fascinating because uh, for one, I, you know, I, I wish I had prepared for this question by actually bringing a couple of pictures, um, but they're absolutely beautiful, right? So if you go back to the 1930s, Las Vegas, you find these absolutely stunning multicolored images on the casino dice and also the names mm -hmm. and the fonts. And you can actually look at how over the last hundred years or so, the casino dice actually represent a changing culture are changing human behaviors and also a beautiful form of art. So I my wife and I both got uh, into it a uh, few years ago. <clears throat> and I, I just, it, to me, it, it is, again, one of those things that very many people don't do. Now it's funny because much as I, we both love collecting casino dice, neither of us are gamblers and we would do horrible at craps. I think we don't gamble primarily because we are horrible at it. <laughs> it's lack of competence than anything else. <laughs> but to me, it's just, it's, it's art, it's uh, history, and uh, it's just understanding that. So there is, no, there is no material aspect to it as much as there is an admiration for the history of us as a people in that small part of the United States represented through two acrylic plastic cubes. Um, it's really refreshing to see, you know, people of men of science are always pegged as boring people. Uh, and, you know, I always love to talk to people who have uh, really nuanced and varied um, hobbies. And I think that, that this partly reflection in your work also, when you look at things from so many different perspectives, like one of the outstanding aspect uh, when I was reading your work um, is that you have analyzed things on many different levels from different lenses from uh, different heights and zoom levels. And we have already talked on the show uh, so far about uh, the wealth of data that we have so far in petabytes, in exabytes. We don't even have computing powers for that. Um, you talked about a radical shift in healthcare from siloed EHR systems uh, like Epic Cogito and Sorian operation reporting to um, electronic data warehouses and OLAP cubes. Um, and, you know, this shift um, is already passed, um, instant past now. And now we're moving to data lakes. Um, you know, you can talk about a more 
ideological idea for now, data meshes uh, and different architectures. You know, you can always play with topologies and, and talk about these things and managing an, um, a data which is so astronomically huge, uh, putting them through the ETL pipelines into a new architecture and then making sense of that. How do you even manage that? Like, how do you think of uh, things in a holistic manner and not um, an siloed operational domain specific um, problem? So it's, I would, I would say it's, uh, there's two answers to it, which I would take. I'll take the first part of it going to your question about, you know, data warehouses and cubes and lakes and marts and all of these wonderful things that have happened in the last 25 years with respect to our ability to use different technology methods to be able to capture this data in all its forms and shapes and be able to manage it. Um, I think fabrics, speaking specifically about things, I think data fabrics and data meshes definitely represent a huge step forward in how that data is arranged and how that data is consumed. But I think the reality is that the world we live in from a pure technological perspective is going to be a combination of multiple things. There's going to be need for governed data, uh, highly regulated data, for example, that you do for regulatory reporting uh, that needs to be in a certain format. There will be need for uh, quickness of access, rapid access, context sensitive access, which is where I think the fabrics and mesh architectures are going. There is also going to be a need for more real-time data needs, especially going back to the internet of healthcare things, where none of those technologies we talked about are going to be the best way, shape and form. And we may have to come up with new ways of being able to quickly access the data in near real time, especially if there is a possibility or a prediction that an never event could happen and be able to manage that. One, the, uh, the reality is that from an enterprise data landscape, the chief data officer, the chief analytics officer, and more importantly, their counterparts, the CEO, the CFO, the CEO, and so on and so forth, have to think about let a thousand flowers bloom. And depending on what day it is of the year and who we want to impress, we will create the bouquet based off of that. So on Valentine's Day, red roses are in fashion. It's the time when the price of red roses goes through the roof and you don't find enough of them. So if your use case is getting roses from your garden, let it be red roses for Valentine's Day. But if you're going to basically honor your ancestors and leave flowers at their grave, then <clears throat> you want some other bouquet and so on and so forth. I like that metaphor a lot of let a thousand flowers bloom and pick out the ones that you need but let it be flowers and not weeds because weeds bunched together don't look very nice. Now, having said that, in, especially from a healthcare and life sciences perspective, and also I would say, when I, I include health insurance in that, a lot of the conversations is always on structured data. We always talk about warehouses and arts and cubes and things like that. To me, the larger value is unstructured data. And uh, going back to a conversation you and I were having on LinkedIn, I think it was this week, was if you kind of take a look at, for example, what China is doing in the big data and AI ML space, I have had the opportunity to track very closely what is happening in China in the healthcare space. And I've been invited a couple of times. I've not made the trip. I should have. It was a very short ride then from China, which is a country I, would, I haven't visited, which I would love to visit, to Mongolia, uh, frankly, which I would also love to visit. But the level of investment and the reality that the, the Chinese government recognizes now healthcare as a social contract. And the absolute stupendous uh, things that are happening there across board, wellness, prevention, uh, treatments, access, right? I, I, I think, especially when it comes to text, image, and voice, uh, China is a great example for 
the rest of the world from a healthcare perspective in terms of how to harness data. Now, is it is I, again, I want to be very clear. It's by no means equal across all of China. There's also haves and have nots within China. And it's not always equal even between say cities and rural areas. But some of the progress that is happening there, Minaj, is, you know, again, we are not talking about other things such as geopolitics and so on and so forth. We are talking about how do you use big data and analytics and AI ML for the greatest good? I think we all have a lot to learn from each other. And part of that conversation must include what the People's Republic of China is doing with respect to its healthcare big data. You're absolutely spot on. You know, whenever I get the chance to talk to my um, Chinese peers, it, it's a, such a enriching conversation. You learn always something new. And I'm frankly getting to the point where, you know, finding new things is becoming harder and harder when you talk to wonderful people like yourself. Um, and then you're surrounded with a lot of information. Uh, newness is something um, that's, that's becoming um, a rare commodity, but these Chinese um, people, um, you have probably have read the report um, that was released last year, State of the AI report, in which they talked that how Chinese, um, or let's say the research originating from China uh, has now bypassed US research on AI. Uh, the number of publications um, in top journals, um, Chinese. Um, a lot of patents they're coming from um, are Chinese institutions. On top of that, 80% um, of people working in AI in the US, um, like you and other people are from um, Asian origin. So I think the tides are shifting quite a lot when it comes to um, AI. But we have talked about, um, and you have a very poetic way of uh, putting things by the way. I don't know if it's coming from your communication degree in English, but wonderful. Um, so we talked about the, Big data, three Vs, two additional Vs. We have also talked about the ETL pipelines, the managing of the data. Let's get to the final part, which is of most value to uh, business staff, C-suite uh, employees, um, people in governments, public sector, which is now what? Descriptive analysis, prescriptive analysis, predictive analysis, and healthcare. You have had some fascinating ideas um, that that I would like um, you to expand um, on and uh, let people know that how these three um, are of um, critical importance in the whole grand scheme of um, ML and AI. Oh, I, I know we have been talking for almost an hour and 45 minutes, Vinajoy, here in this long form format, which I truly enjoy because you can go beyond sound bites and actually have a conversation. Uh, now, I'll also admit that a lot of your audience would be thinking, oh my God, I've got to listen to Prashant for an hour and 45 minutes. They won't say that about you. Um, if I may just say one quick comment before I take that last question that you asked is I am, and not just because I live here, uh, but I, and, and you know this pretty well, that I've lived in quite a few countries and subcultures, probably more than most people over the last 40 plus years. And uh, not just growing up in India where I studied in five different schools by the time I finished grade 12, which is almost like studying in five different countries in five different states in India, with the level of diversity that exists in that culture and also then internationally. I am a huge believer and a huge fan and a huge optimist about American innovation and ingenuity. And the reason for that is because I think there are a few things that America does really well. The power of the individual is celebrated much more so in America than I think any other culture in the last 5,000 years of human history. And there is something to be said for that. And that power of the individual, again, going back to the conversation we were having about Sufism and Buddhism and others, is there is something to be said for the ability of a good human mind who is given the freedom to be able to explore things 
And I think this culture, American culture represents that. So while yes, I do think that in the last 10 years or so, certain other countries and cultures have made some substantial progress. It's not a zero sum game. The fact that, you know, culture X or culture Y or country X or country Y is doing something, we shouldn't fear that. We should celebrate that. But at the same time, there are things where I've been reading where people call it, uh, you know, it's the end of the American dream, the end of American innovation. And I would say, be careful before you say things like that. Because if you are a student of history and you are a student of data, the ability for America to reinvent itself time and again on the turn of a dime, no other country or culture can do it. And I would, I would strongly think that people who write America off are doing it at a risk to their reputation. Frankly speaking, you just cannot write America off. And I would say that even if I were not living in America, frankly. Uh, coming back to the question you asked, in our next book, I talk about something called the impact framework for the use of AI in the enterprise. I standing for imagination, uh, which consists of invention, discovery, and innovation, all three of them. M stands for maturity. Uh, you got to understand where you need to stand. Maturity will vary. It can vary across maturity in strategy, maturity in leadership, maturity in process, and of course, maturity in data. The P stands for people. You can't bring about change and digital transformation without bringing people into it and being able to lift their game and uh, uh, help them and educate them. And going back to our conversation about how do you build successful teams, getting the right skill sets, getting the right staffing model in place is important. The A stands for augmentation and amplification as opposed to just automation, which are where some of the conversation is today, if not a lot of the conversation. So I would say that it's time for us to retire the definition of the A in AI as just being artificial. It is augmentative intelligence. It is amplified intelligence. In certain cases, automated intelligence, and of course, artificial intelligence. C is culture. Uh, you can't change if you don't address the needs of culture and change it. And finally, D is transformation, where that is your end goal. And that's where you want to get. Um, Rashan, I don't know how to put in words how how much I'm enjoying this conversation with you. And there, it's a very um, rare chance when I get to talk to someone who's very uh, diverse um, in his in trust um, and in, in his views. You made quite a lot of ambidextrous jumps in your career. Um, a chemical engineer who then studied linguistics and then became uh, part of analytics industry and now in a leadership role. You must have a recipe for being good at everything. Are you going to let it out today or is it going to be an off-camera thing? Well, no, I'll tell you what the recipe is. The recipe is uh, very simple. Be curious. Be curious. And don't, don't, let, don't let your own mind be imprison you, frankly. Right? And uh, be open to change. Be curious. Uh, those are the two things that my parents taught me. And it, of course, helped a lot also, Minaj, because as we discussed prior, living in so many countries, living in so many cultures, moving every couple of years, created this absolute open-mindedness, which I, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting to anyone that they move every two years to get to that point of view. But if you can develop the curiosity aspect of it, and more importantly, if you don't take yourself seriously, right? Uh, don't don't treat uh, don't treat yourself as the be all and end all of things. Understand that there is a lot more to learn from anybody, even people who may have a different background from you, or who may have a different education, and be open to ideas. That's all it is. Like, um, 
I don't even know five years from now, 10 years from now, where I will end up. It's, it's, it's an, and what I mean by that is, I may end up playing a role that is pretty different 10 years from now than what I'm doing today, right? Um, but I keep myself open to that possibility and, and it just excites me. And uh, it, is, it is as much, it is as much an unknown for me as it is an unknown for somebody who doesn't know me. And there's nothing more exciting than that. <laughs> Uh, there, there's a very sweet flavor of um, youth and um, innocence in what you say because you know these are, these are the lines from people who are in twenties who, who are looking forward towards their careers and maintaining this curiosity at your age is I find it fascinating and you know I hope that I would have some of it when um, I get to your age. But do you also attribute a little bit of that um, to? Um, a place where you studied and um, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadala and you shared the same alma mater, um, which is Manipal Institute of Technology. I mean, uh, tell us a little bit about your intellectual upbringing in, in that place um, or what did you learn from there? Uh, from a chemical engineering point of view, I think my professors will tell you with absolutely a lot of fact that I didn't learn much from a chemical engineering point of view. And I think it's true because otherwise I would be a chemical engineer, right? Uh, as soon as I finished my chemical engineering degree, I got into ad design and creative and technical writing, which was my first job out of engineering degree. So you may kind of wonder, okay, so this guy did this engineering degree and ended up in a completely creative world. So why on earth did you even go to engineering degree? I, you know, I think uh, the lessons I got out of that from a structured way of thinking an engineering mindset is something I use every day today. So it, it's interesting, Minaj, because I think you'll notice something here, right? The chemical engineering degree was a way for me to get more of a structured education in technology and science and, and you know, basic science, right? In some ways. Uh, but I think it goes back to, again, what I think education should be. Education should be two things. It should create a better individual. It should create a better citizen of the society. And it should create a set of life skills that you learn and technical skills or non-technical skills that you learn. And to me, chemical engineering was one part of giving me the technical skills and certain mathematical basis, right? And then I would say that the other parts of it are closer to the Gurukul system we used to use back in the day in India and Pakistan um, and other places in South Asia and also the Greek education system which was about creating better people, rationally thinking, critically thinking, people who can be better contributors to society and who can be better people. Somewhere along the lane, I think in this hyper-specialized world that we live in, skills have become more focused and more important than the other softer aspects, if I may call it that, which I think actually serve us as a society and as individuals much more. So um, obviously, if you look at our career trajectories, I think you can say very clearly that Satya got more out of that education than I did. Well, I'm sure that you know, you, you're know you creating value in your own way and not everyone has to make windows. Um, I was just wondering, uh, uh, and I've talked about this with a lot of guests, uh, and I don't know how in touch you are with um, Bollywood movies anymore, but Three Idiots is something, you know, that comes up within um, a lot of our episodes about, you know, all Indian ma males have to become an engineer to make their parents proud. But um, I guess you took a very risky decision after you become an engineer, you went into a, um, arts um, or uh, let's say more social science um, domain. And I was just wondering, in the grander, grand scheme of things, how... Ha how important is happiness um, as in comparison to success and ambition? I mean, we live in a world where people 
put themselves out there, stretch them so much at the cost of our happiness and making their peers and their parents and everyone else happy that, you know, they kind of die within themselves. And, and that kind of speaks for itself uh, when you look at the state of the society. How was it you, when you were growing up in your 20s, in your 30s, a lot of pressure? Um, uh, what did you think of life? So, so Minaj, look, again, um, I think in the end, the you know, p- p- people will do what they do at that point in time that they need to do. And I, by no means, like I, earlier I mentioned, my journey has been one where I haven't necessarily ever thought about this is absolutely where I want to be in life and every single action I take is going to get me there. It would be absolutely disingenuous of me to say that that's the case. But at the same time for me, and I'll also admit this very openly, that happiness has been an evolving term. When I was in my 20s, happiness meant something else. When I was in my 30s, happiness meant something else. Now when I'm in my 40s, happiness means something else. And I have no doubts that over the next 20 to 30 years, it will continue to change. And the thing is, again, going back to a philosophical construct, I I strongly believe in the Greek philosopher Epicurus. And I follow a lot of Epicurean philosophy about what happiness should be. So I know in one of your previous conversations, you talked about foie gras, and uh, we and I, you and I were talking about Halim. And if you look at me, you know that I'm a foodie. Don't get me wrong, right? But Epicurus says that if you have to have a piece of bread and water to drink, then you should have that piece of bread in the company of family and friends. Because a person who consumes foie gras in isolation on their own kitchen table without family and friends is basically, as Epicurus says, he doesn't say foie gras, but he says that that person is like a wolf which devours food to keep its bodily functions going, right? We are better than that in terms of supposedly belonging to a higher order species. So uh, a piece of bread Uh, with water, with the right company and with the right experiences is any day better than even a bowl of Halim that I'm going to eat by myself. That's a deep thing. And I don't doubt it for a minute when I look at um, the size of Indian weddings. Um, But let's get to (laughs) some of the things that might happen if you overeat. And for that, um, we talked about uh, precision medicine and uh, epidemiological data that we have. And this seems to have been emerging health crisis in which we look at um, patients individually, we look at them uh, in terms of diseases and uh, pigeonhole them into one category, and reading about them, understanding them, noting their symptoms. But a very different lens tells us to think of their social origins. And you talk in your book about the social determinants of health, which is SDOH um, in short, and also activities of daily living, um, which I think it's a, it's a very astute insight into human culture and how societies are formed and their lifestyles are. And you previously talked about the lifestyle diseases and not the biological diseases. Um, so, for example, um, if you look at the statistics, heart diseases and strokes are on the top of the casualty causes um, around the world. And diabetes is typically exactly. one of the largest contributors to that. Yes, and um, a lot of uh, multivariate studies have already uh, indicated to the unhealthy lifestyle and diet contributing to that. And I'm just wondering, uh, how would that fit into big data um, healthcare future and uh, medical technology? So I think again, it's, it's, it's one of the things where, you know, someone I was, I was on a chat with 
uh, Don Lee, who runs a podcast and who has been interacting with us on LinkedIn. And um, Don and I had this chat where he said, oh, somebody said social determinants of health is just a fancier word for poverty. A guest office had said that. Now, I think that is true to an extent, Vinaj, but I think it's not the only one. Poverty and income is generally a contributor to social determinants, for sure, because people who are poorer have less access, right? And that can contribute to how your healthcare journey goes. But to your earlier point, the people who seem to be struggling more right now with lifestyle diseases are not exactly people who are poor. If you're poor, you don't have the luxury of suffering from a lifestyle disease. It's people who have enough food on the table right now. But there are other contributors also. For example, your, your race, your ethnicity, right? And these are things that, frankly, we should be talking more about. And I'm not saying that we are not talking about it, but looking at these factors and the fact that your zip code or your postal code can be as important a determiner of your health from a precision medicine perspective as your genetic code, I think we need to spend more time and dollars on that and population health as much as we do on genomics and multiomics and so on and so forth, right? So I think uh, social determinants, especially now, if you see what is happening in South Asia, you see what is happening in China, right? Uh, become much more important. And uh, it's also true of the West, right? And to your earlier comment about behavioral health, mental health, happiness, there are so many of those things that, come together, right? Uh, I would say that people who are happy in general tend to have better health and better outcomes than people who are not. And that's also something we should look at. It's not just about income. It's not just about poverty. It is not just about uh, race and ethnicity or with postal code you live in. It is also about, are you happy? And what can we do as a society to support each other in that? getting to that shared construct of happiness. Mm. I think Eric Schmidt brings a wonderful point that most people don't appreciate enough, which is that when we first created um, the genome sequence, it costed $3 million. Now it's $1,000. And the amount of information that we have in order to put that into preventative care and epidemiological um, profiling um, is unprecedented. And but we've talked a lot about um, social, um, healthcare, epidemiology, data. Let's bring in some of your uh, critics also. Um, so frankly, this show is not about buttering you up. So you, know, you have to answer the <laughs> questions about, from other perspective also. Uh, Michael Moore released his uh, movie, I think it was back in 2013, Sicko, uh, which became a blockbuster uh, in Mendes. And I don't know, you, you can have your own opinions, but um, this this a part of the show is for the critics. So um, he talked a lot about people going to Canada uh, for their healthcare because U.S. wouldn't do that for them. He talks a lot about um, the preventative medicine that they're able to afford, that the copay bills, the um, insurance industries, um, lack of indiscretions. Uh, he also talked about uh, some of people, some of the people from your own industries. Uh, for example, Dr. Linda Pino who worked uh, at Humana, went um, in front of Congress and talked about how she denied different patients medical health care, which resulted in their death. And she talked then about the HMO industry. These concerns are valid. Uh, I do know that you were part of the industry, but you know, let's detach you from um, your job and being as a person. How would you feel if you were on the receiving end? And what, what can we do to improve that? Again, how would I feel if I were at the receiving end of a decision that I thought was not based in data, was not based in science, and was arbitrary? I would feel horrible about it, as I would do. It's not just healthcare, though. It could mean anything. Uh, it could mean me wanting to forget Epicurus for a minute and go to my favorite restaurant and get denied a reservation. So in the end, 
it's not just healthcare. Anything that basically well, you doesn't do realize have... that the consequences of healthcare wrong decisions are way higher than uh, Epicurean bread. No, no, no. But the point is that uh, how would I feel, right? I, I would feel horrible about it because any decision that you want to see be taken, you want it to be done on objective evidence, right? I think we can all agree on that. Now, with this postmodern world we live in, objective evidence itself is not so objective, according to some. And I think, you know, evidence and analytics is also dependent on what data you're using, frankly, right? So in the last 10 years or so, uh, Minaj, a lot of the work I've been doing outside of my professional responsibilities and who I work for is actually on how to improve access and affordability of healthcare for Americans. And I've been doing that in a very bipartisan way. Um, I have worked with folks who are, I would say, right of center. I have worked with people who are left of center and shades that go beyond right and left of center. Because I think, unfortunately, we live now in a time where common sense conversations around access and affordability are painted with a partisan lens and a doctrinaire ideology. And to me, going back to the comment that you made, people's health and wellness and our evolution as a society is too important for us to let any one political perspective pretend that they've got all the solutions. If you are serious about solving the problem as opposed to making a movie, then you've got to accept that there are different perspectives to the problem and bring those perspectives together to solve it. And I've, I've been doing that. I've been living that uh, without going into examples. I've got uh, uh, democratic state governments that have quoted my book uh, extensively in their precision medicine to reports on legislatures. I have done work with, for example, the last White House, right? So where would that put me? Am I red or am I blue? Um, no, I really don't think it's a fair question. I think the question is, am I doing what I can within the opportunity I have and the constraints I have to make healthcare more accessible and affordable? For sure. Am I doing it with an ideological point of view, one or the other? No. Am I trying to, within what I can do, bring people together? Yes. Yeah, I think... Um we in the end are responsible for our own behavior and contributions that we can make towards uh, making a situation better and making the best out of that. Um, and in, in in that field, you certainly have uh, put way more than you have taken out. Um, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing right now. The Your work as VP um, of um, Healthcare and Life Science and Insurance at H2O, um, is a huge responsibility. Um, what are you doing at the moment to make the situation better? Um, what is HDO's vision towards uh, making improvement in those sectors? How are they going to approach that problem? Tell our audience a little bit about what it entails. Again, I don't, uh, you know, I don't mean to talk for H2O or some of the folks at H2O because again, I'm not doing this conversation from representing the company or the corporate point of view. Though I would say one thing which I'm extremely proud of and the reason why I came back to H2O is for H2O, health and life sciences are not uh, basically a set of solutions or analytic problems. It is in our DNA um, and our CEO Sri Satish not only talks about it, but he preaches and practices, which is very important, right? And it's, for us, health is something that we can use data science for good. We can use AI to create relief for patients, for uh, physicians, for nurses, and create a more well and informed populace. And 
going back to where we started this conversation, given the world of big data we live in, and I will continue to use that word because I think it's still relevant separate from whether what specific technology you use. I think it becomes more important now to convert that big data into uh, whatever interim steps, call it smart data, call it something else, into features, into insights. And it is, that's a mission for us, those of us who work together. And there are several folks at H2O AI Health who believe in bringing the best of technology together and to solve the important problems of the day around health, science, access, affordability. And it's absolutely heartwarming to work with a like-minded group to be able to do it. The talent at H2O Minaj, as you know yourself, is probably, I think, I, I would like to say, you said it, so I'm going to quote you. It's some of the best Kaggle grandmasters in the world. And objectively, I would say, definitely the top single digit ranks, including number one, number two, number four, and so on and so forth, right? So to have the opportunity and the access to be able to work with the likes of people with that background, that excellence, and the passion, and then to be able to solve some of the important problems of the day. Um, all I have to say is you get those opportunities. A lot of times people don't get the opportunity to do that. Uh, in some cases, you get to do it once. Uh, I have just been extremely fortunate that I've had that opportunity to do it more than once. And H2O is the latest incarnation. And I'm really looking forward to being able to uh, contribute my bit and collaborate in order to be able to do that. I mean, again, as you know, uh, as a company, we do a lot of open source. You know, and, and I think the bigger thing is also working with the community to be able to put data science to its greatest effect. And that's what I think is really the frontier that is going to bring the greatest value. Um, Prashant, I might actually take up you on your offer someday um, to join you for Halim and Biryani in Hyderabad. But uh, finally wrapping up things, uh, how does your wife and your daughter think about your foodie background, your chemical engineering degree and your leadership? And are you doing something about your uh, missing days on um, epileptical machine? Uh, well, you know, after all this conversation, I have to uh, double down so that I don't become the poster child for the stuff that I only preach and don't practice. <laughs> on that note, uh, I hope that you were able to follow through on your plans uh, about personal health also, <laughs> as well as your uh, strategic plan and H2O. Um, thank you so much for being with us, uh, Prashant. And I wish this conversation could go forever. Um, and hopefully we'll have uh, a lot of more chances to do that. Um, would love to have you on your show uh, some other time uh, when um, there's more to tell on HDO. Uh, thank you so much. Anything you would like to say to uh, people who are listening to you or waiting for your next book? I, I really enjoyed this conversation, Minaj. Thank you for the opportunity. And, um, you know, uh, you can, people can connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, I'm, as much as I can, I'm happy to help people out, uh, keeping other things in mind. Uh, you know, I can't say certain things that would be, uh, I would say that if, if it doesn't involve me sharing what we are doing exactly from a strategic perspective or representing the company and so on and so forth, um, as much as I can help people, I try to do my best like some of your previous guests. I see that common thread over there. Uh, sometimes I may not always be able to do it for time constraints and so on and so forth, but it is never due to lack of desire. So I welcome having the conversation with your audience. Superb. Um, so for all personal question and uh, under table 
um, deals, uh, please contact uh, Prashant um, <laughs> off the camera. Um, and uh, we are also giving out five copies of uh, Prashant's book within uh, the US. So uh, if you are one of the viewers, please contact me. I will be happy to um, get you. Yeah, the only thing I would request is for those people who receive those copies, please do leave a review on Amazon. Sure. Because absolutely. for for book authors, reviews matter. They are worth their weight in gold. And send us uh, a picture with the book would be great actually to showcase them. Um, join our Slack community also as well. We have a lot of conversations around our interviews, a lot of resources that come. The podcast is also available on Spotify, Google, and Apple, as well as YouTube. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, and I'll see you soon.